All right, what's going on, everybody? My name is Sean Vaughn, and this is Champions Material. As always, glad to be here. Now, coming out of 2020, which on a lot of levels was uh, definitely heavy on everyone in some way, shape, or form, we, we, we come into 2021, we turn the page, and we come into 2021, you know, definitely just looking at things from a perspective of, hey, it's got to get better. It's got it's to be better than what 2020 was for us. And we transition into January, we transition into the new year. And immediately in January, you know, we deal with the elections down in uh, Georgia. We deal with the, the, the end of the disputed uh, presidential election. Um, you know, we get the president, the outgoing president Trump's response to that. And then we get literally an insurrection, a coup, a coup attempt, an attack on our nation's capital or at the Capitol building, I should say, um, unprecedented, unbelievable. And what it did was from a political standpoint, from a racial standpoint, just from an overall standpoint, you know, it sparked some, uh, some, some heavy conversations, sometimes uncomfortable conversations, but conversations that need to be had. And we're bringing that to Champions Material and joining me today to discuss all that and more from the Villains and Vinyl podcast, my man, CJ. Welcome to Champions Material, brother. Hey, man. Humbled to be back. Thank you for having me, man. Let's, I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, absolutely. So let's just go ahead and get right to it. Um, and full disclosure, you start where you want to start and you go where you want to go, whether that's, you know, the election down in Georgia, uh, the remarks of Trump uh, once he was um, officially uh, defeated and the election dispute was uh, settled. Um, the Capitol and what you know went down there. Just what are your thoughts? You start where you start and you go where you want to go, brother. The floor is yours. I, I mean, I don't know what to say. All I will say is the way to sum up this whole political climate is you have to think about how hated Trump was that Georgia mm -hmm. turned blue. Like, just think about that for a second. Like, one of the most Republican stronghold states that has ever existed right. turned blue, not only in the presidential election, but they also lost two Senate seats mm. in large part because, and no disrespect to the, to the senators that won, but the reason they won in large part was because it was a rejection of Trump's philosophy. Now, how large that rejection will be Overall, as a nation, I don't know. And that's kind of the scary part is that Trumpism isn't going away just because Trump is, right? And, no. and, that's, and that's the assumption that Trump is going away, right? He might be more dangerous or just as dangerous now out of office than he was in because now he can influence... He could be super influential. And, I, and maybe he was more dangerous in office. Let me back back and say he probably was. But his level of danger now is, is not that far off, let me say that. Because mm. his base is still motivated, right? And in two years, we'll see. Because then we're going to have our midterm elections. And this is the chance. That's exactly how long Biden and and Kamala have, right? President Biden, Vice President Kamala have to kind of persuade people that, hey, this is different than it was before, right? Because what's going to happen is black people are going to get a level of apathy because they're going to be like, if nothing changes, they're going to be like, well, why come out again, right? Why come yeah. out again? So, no, no, this is going to be interesting as far as the Capitol riots. I mean, it was literally white privilege on display. Like, let's like, if you wanted to explain white privilege to a person, you know, you can go through the whole diatribe about this and that, or you could just show them the Capitol riot video and be like, "Look, we all know this is the this is the truth that everyone knows." If that was a group, and it's so obvious to say, but I still think it needs to be said. Mm that if a group of black people would have did the black or brown people would have did the exact same thing the outcome would have been completely different first off they i don't even know if we make it into the capital <laughs> you know so mm. 
So the fact that they let them in, well, not let, but the fact that they got into the Capitol, that the Capitol was that undermanned, considering that you knew they were coming. You know, like I said, once again, just a you thorough. Cannot, I'm sorry, I can't interrupt this. You can't. I had to interrupt. You cannot understate what you just said. They knew yeah. they were coming. We had. We had. I had to just bring that back out, just for emphasis, man. Continue on, brother. Oh no, that's the thing. They knew they were coming, which you know, I don't want to get in my conspiracy theory bag, but just common sense would tell you there's something going on right there, right? Like mm. if they knew they were coming. And it was that under, it wasn't like it was just a little bit <laughs> understaffed. It was like, you're staffing this like it's just a regular, regular day with no type of protest going on. When I saw what you had when it was a Black Lives Matter protest and Trump wanted to take the picture in the Bi- with the Bible like he actually reads it. Like I saw, I see, I seen it. Yeah. Like <laughs> to use the, <laughs> I seen it. So. Man. It's just the, it is literally an example of white privilege on display that I think is, if you wanted to see like white privilege in actual action, not in, you know, in just like a picture of it, that is what that is. So, because, and you can even look at how they're being charged, right? What they did was treason. Literally. Like, like what they did, they it was an insurrection. It was a weak insurrection. It wasn't a successful one, but it was an attempted insurrection nonetheless. Absolutely. And when you look at how they were charged, it's some bullshit. <laughs> it's some bullshit. So, yeah, like, I don't know what to say to it other than got a new administration in and we'll see how it goes. I, I'm not that, that hopeful. <laughs> to be honest, but you why, know, why not? That, that's 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 a, the important point that you just brought up. That at this point, you just you said I'm not that hopeful. What put you in that frame of mind, man? Because I, well, let me be honest. I think it'll be better than Trump. Like I don't want to sit here and be like, oh, it'll be Trump. But I also think it'll be the status quo, a return to the status quo. And I think because Trump was so bad for a lot of people, that'll be okay. Mm-hmm. All right, just to return back to the status quo and some sem- semblance of normalcy, but it is just, it, like think about what the status quo was, right? The status quo wasn't necessarily that great for us either, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it wasn't that great for everyone either. So that's what I think is going to happen. I think they will return to normal, which, granted, after Trump is saying something, like I don't want to be, I want to be fair, but that's not enough. Right. So, do you? No, go ahead. No, 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 no. no. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, do you believe in? You know, you want to talk about a potential controversial statement, but fuck it, I don't care. What? Where I'm coming from on this, and I'm not specifically just talking about the insurrection. I think you, you know, hit that clearly. I don't think I need to add on to that. But I'm just saying in regard to Trump. It's not that I believe that everything about him and what he was potentially trying to do, particularly trying to pull us away from dependency on other countries and become more independent was bad. I do believe the way he went about not understanding the power of his words and the effect that that was going to have on this country and how divided it made this country where you can't even have civil conversations. You can't agree to disagree. You disagree with one thing tied to Trump, it's like you disagree with everything. You agree with one thing tied to Trump, you agree with everything. And people are so divided and they're so, as I mentioned on a previous podcast, shout out to Enigmas Unchained, check them out. Individuals got to a point where they felt so passionate about how they saw it, whether they were pro or anti-Trump, that they were more determined to be right than to get it right. And what that did was that just created a division that just did not allow us to have, you know, healthy dialogue. And to Joe Biden's uh, credit, and I'm going to say credit, uh, during his inauguration, that wasn't a political speech. That was a speech that pointed to the fact that we are between a pandemic, between the economy, and between 
everything that went on from a social standpoint last year, not just with black people, just period, that we're in a space right now where we cannot, we can't overcome these things if we remain divided. Put aside your feelings about this policy, that, whatever the case may be, we got to come together because this, all this shit we're dealing with is unprecedented. And we can't do that if we have just been determined to just pick a side and stick with it. We can't. And that was the thing that I took away from that speech more than anything else. I, do I believe Trump is literally a bad man in every single aspect? No, I do not. I believe that he went about things. And, and also just sometimes it's not what you say, it's how you say it and not understanding how important that is. And I believe that they call it the term, what being presidential, understanding the room you're in, the office that you in, you're in. If you lose an election as he clearly did, you know what you do? You concede, you can, you can be upset about it. You can feel some kind of way about it, but what you don't do is you don't incite people with your words and you don't not show up at an inauguration. What do we, this is a, Biden is a 46th president Somebody fact check me if I'm wrong. This is the first time where the outgoing president literally chose to not attend the inauguration of the incoming president. I mean, his response to the Capitol riots, a couple of weak tweets followed by a statement, oh, we, you know, go home, go home. And then you want to say in that same space, well, they stole it from us, knowing that those are the very words that caused the insurrection in the first place. Feel how you feel is one thing, but you have to understand the power of your words, particularly from that office. You have to have self-awareness to know the room you're in and know the effect that your words are going to have. And what that's, and he's not the reason for this division. It's not like, oh, well, everybody was kumbaya and all together before him. As you said, the stat quo, we had a stat quo before this where we had issues. Unfortunately, in, his, in this case, these last four years, they were just greatly exacerbated by the way that he chose to go about doing things. So we got to come together and we got to fix this shit because it's, this is bigger than any race. This is bigger than any policy. This is bigger than any economic class, any business. This is bigger than all of us. That's my takeaway. And the Capitol was the, the Capitol attack to me was the punctuation of a lot of tension that has been going on for far, far be long before he came into office, but was just greatly exacerbated and pushed along with by his actions since he's been in office. Oh, yeah. And uh, just to fact check, make sure we're all good. I think there was a couple other presidents that didn't attend the inauguration. That was like 152 years ago. Mm -hmm. So just to kind of give you kind of a thing. But that's, but that's why I think Trump is dangerous, right? Do I think if we go policy by policy that I would disagree with every policy that he's ever implemented? Probably not. Fair enough. That's, uh, I think that's very fair. But the reason why he is dangerous is because he's xenophobic. <laughs> mm. He's If he is not a classist, if he's not racist, if you, which I personally think he's racist, but I know some people don't think he is. I don't get how you think that, but let's say you don't think he is. He's at the very least a classist, right? Mm. Where he looks down on poor people, which is part of his very base, which is the which is the craziness of it. But I think he's a classist, and I think he's dangerous because, to your very point, he he does not care about rounding up that group. Mm. Like he, like most people understand their political power, and I'm not saying they willed it in the best way all the times, Democrat or Republican, because they don't. But they at least understand, and they tip, they may even push it to the limit. But they they know there are lines that they just cannot cross. Yes. All right? For Trump, there is no line. All right? That's, that, and that's why he is dangerous. There is no line. And he riles up a base that's already feeling rightly, wrongly, fairly, or unfairly a base that already feels threatened. So he's speaking directly to them like he's one of them, when in fact he isn't. Mm. But he's speaking like he's to them like he's one of them. And he doesn't care about the result as long as it gives him power. Dangerous. 
can't have and, and, and that's why that's more dangerous than any policy. Like, because maybe he has done good, to be fair. But that is far outweighed by his dangerousness to a democratic society, right? That's far outweighed. So that's why I think it's an issue. Like, think about what just happened, right? He contested an election to a degree that everybody knew, like, nobody was surprised that, that he did it, right? So he contested and he riled up a base to storm the Capitol, right? I think we're saying it because he's had so many scandals that we're just kind of numb to it. But let's think about that for a second. If any other president had done that, (laughs) what would be the blowback? And for Trump, it's just Tuesday. You know what I mean? Like, it's just another day because he has so many scandals, so many issues that we honestly overlook them. Like, it's hard to even think about. Right. Right? Because every day it's something new. So... Yeah, he's a dangerous man. And I don't think that danger goes away just because he's not in office, right? So I think his ability to affect policy and stuff goes away. So to backtrack what I said earlier, I think he was way more dangerous in office. But it doesn't mean that he's not at all dangerous now. And I think that's what you got to be on guard of. And let's not forget that a lot of people who share his beliefs and a lot of people who used his tactics then w- did win local offices and local Senate races, right? But I, I don't think that can be understated as well. Like, there were people who won Senate races using the same tactics, the same type of dog whistling, I forget the term, that he used in order to get elected. So now the Republican Party has seen that that is a viable strategy to win. And at the end of the day, a political party, Democrat, Republican, they're just about winning seats and acquiring power, period. That's, that is what they do. We can argue about the motivations, but their, their objective is win races, gain power, and that their agenda. And they have seen that that is a successful strategy. So I don't think it's going away anytime soon. So, Did you believe before January of 2021 that in your lifetime, you would see literally the entirety of major social media platforms either suspend or indefinitely ban the president of the United States from using their platforms to express whatever his views are or whatever, you know, whatever he wanted to, uh, you know, to to, uh, relay to the people that follow him. Did you believe that you would ever see something like that? And is that a part of what you were just speaking to a moment ago as far as why you think this man and what what he was trying to do was dangerous. I never thought I would see it. And if I did, I would have thought they would have did it already. Right? Because Trump has already said some some stuff. Right, right. That that you would be like, man, come on. But honestly, I didn't think they would do it. And I think that's more so those images from the Capitol riots, which I think we keep going back to because it's a monumental event, right? It is a, that is something that is crazy to see happen. So I think they they brought the public pressure because I think had they, they there's no way they could have allowed him to continue to be on those platforms. Right. There's there's just no way, right? So I do wonder how long those bans will last. That is what I'm curious about. Um, but we will see. I'm also curious to see how that trial goes. I mean, deep down, I don't think anything's going to happen to him. But I am curious to see how it goes. But yeah, like, just think about that. They banned, and, and he was a sitting president at the time, even though he was outgoing. Right, right, but right. He, was still, he was still technically the president. They banned the president of the United States from social media. Like, crazy. <laughs> this, and, and it was justified, right? It wasn't like they were overreaching, overstuffing, in my mind at least. Right. It was justified. So think about how bad you have to be as a Republican to A, get banned, and B, turn Georgia blue. Like, that's just what I'm thinking about. Like, that's like if Texas, that is almost as big of a deal as if Texas turned blue. <laughs> like, like, 
Okay. Or, or Alabama turned right. blue. Like <laughs> certain states are just blue. I mean, or just red. red. Excuse me. Like, you know, so yeah, I I don't know what else to say about them. Like, it's gonna be interesting to see these next couple months to see what happens, to see how I think the pressure will be on Biden and Harris though to do certain things that like I don't think everybody's gonna expect them to do everything, but I do think people are going to expect, you know, to see an increase in the vaccine rollout, whether you take it or not, just an effectiveness of okay, let's see how that goes. Let's pick that up. Let's see what this COVID relief package looks like. Let's see, you know, how are you gonna handle student loan debt? What are your policing policies? So they're gonna see, like, I don't expect them to do everything, but I do expect some building blocks to be there. So these, for, particularly because at the same time in that first hundred days, the trial of Trump is gonna be going on, right? For his involvement or alleged involvement in the Capitol riot. So that'll be interesting to see. Yeah, man. I just wanted to, uh, you know, get your, and I appreciate your thoughts on that. And, you know, a couple of things I want to uh, point out before we transition. Um, my opinions, CJ's opinions, for all those that are listening, and I'm talking to Trump supporters, I want you to remember something that I pointed out a few moments ago. We can agree to disagree. Don't feel attacked. And don't feel like because if you are a Trump supporter or if your opinions lean, you know, toward him in certain areas that you should feel attacked. No one is talking directly to you. You can have a right to your opinion, just like we have a right to ours. What we're giving you our opinions on are tied to, you know, our perspective based on what we've seen in these past four years that culminated earlier this month, the month of January in 2021. It has nothing to do with you. You have a right to feel how you feel just like we do. We can all agree to disagree, but at the end of the day, we all need to be better. We need to do better because we got a lot of, as CJ just pointed out, things that we have to deal with. The vaccine rollout, the economy, student, just everything. Just, you know, loss of jobs, student loan debt. There's plenty ahead of us. And I'm saying us, even though of course we're not the president, but as he mentioned in the speech, there's no one person and no one, you know, job that's on one person in one road that's going to, you know, get this thing turned around and get the ball rolling, get it turned around. It's, it's all up to us. So feel how you feel, pro-Trump, anti-Trump, don't matter. We can agree to disagree, but let's, we got to get our shit together because we got plenty of work ahead of us and we got to be better. I also want to acknowledge Kamala Harris, the first, not only just woman to be sworn in as a vice president, Minority is as well. And I want to point that out because that is significant. And as Joe Biden said in his speech, don't tell me that change isn't possible. We have a vice president who's a minority. So change is possible if we get our act together, if we come together and we get it done. So CJ, I definitely appreciate your thoughts on that. And I want to transition into um, a follow-up to a conversation that we had on season one. And it specifically applied to the police shooting of Jacob Blake and what we saw then was that the uh, NBA, WNBA, and as well as our sports leagues literally decided to put a pause to all activities. And when you're talking about multi-billion dollar businesses, that speaks to the seriousness of not specifically just what happened with Jacob Blake, but also just re what really started, at least on this level, in my opinion, with the murder of George Floyd and just the Black Lives Matter pro, uh, protest. The Black Lives Matter marches, just a call for change, a call for, as you pointed out so eloquently in the, in the episode that we had in season one, we're not asking for special treatment. We're just asking for equality. Why is that so hard? So as we got the news, which was, and you know, unfortunately somewhat kind of buried in everything that was going on in Washington with the, you know, with the Capitol insurrection and also the inauguration, the election. Um, we got news that came down that no ch charges were going to be filed in the shooting of um, Jacob Blake. So, and the, what are your what is your immediate reaction to that? And also, big picture, with everything that we were you know that we saw and the hope that we had uh, regarding you know potential movement and social justice reform. We are that was back in May. So we are. 
you know, several months removed, coming up on a year removed from really everything that went down, starting with George Floyd's murder. How do you, what is your immediate response to what went on with uh, Jacob Blake and no charges being filed? And how do you feel big picture as far as the progress we've made so far in just social justice reform in general? I mean, I think you touched on it, disappointed, but not surprised, mm. right? Like the minute they said he had a knife, whether, whether he was, I don't believe he was using it in a threatening way, whether they're, and I still believe there was another way to de-escalate and handle the situation. They had their out, right? <laughs> they had their out and they, and that's what they were going to do. So we all knew that was kind of going to happen. So I think this at all. Not, not yeah, surprised at all. Mm. Not surprised. Like, and that's kind of where we're at, I think, overall, right? I think you, no matter what you think of the previous administration, whether you agree with them or not, they made their stance on the policing of African Americans pretty damn clear that they were kind of cool with it, how everything was going on. Yes. So you, I didn't expect change from them. I will be curious to see what policies are enacted under this current administration, mm -hmm. right? Because to go back to your thing, me personally, not asking for anything special. I'm just saying, treat us the same way you would everyone else, right? And that, and I hate to go back to the capital riots, but I think they're in a, interlinked in that way because we saw how that was handled, and we know that okay, the amount of shots fired for the whole capital riots by law enforcement, I would venture to say, it was probably less than the shots fired. <laughs> and, and Jake, like, think about that. Wow. <laughs> so, wow. Wow. Damn. So, mm. so. Come on now. And fact check me, I could be wrong, but even if I'm wrong, I promise you it's not by much. Mm. Uh, it's, it's not by much. So, you know, that's the way I think about it. So, we will see what happens. I don't want to discredit what's probably happening on local levels and disrespect the local organizers and activists who are doing their thing and make the changes that way. But I think any real change that's going to come on this issue is going to have to come from a federal level. And I think we'll just kind of see what happens, right? Like, we've been not, sadly, this is a road we all know too well. Like, so, you know, there's hope there, but also, I'll be lying if I said I'm not a little bit apathetic to, to the, like, I don't expect anything to really change, right? I hope it does, but I don't know if I genuinely expect it. So, is your degree of hope equal, more so, less so than it was when we had this conversation in the middle of the summer last year, in the midst of the of the protests, in the midst of the marches, in the midst of this being in the consciousness of several races, not just minorities? Is it? Is it changed at all, or is it like you know what? I felt the same way. Now. I feel the same way now as I did then. I hoped but didn't expect. Uh, I mean, it's probably more to be fair, and that's a, in large part to the current administration and at least their platform that at least they publicly acknowledge, right? Kind of the over policing of African Americans and Black and Brown people in general. So yeah, so there's probably more excitement there. But once again, and you know. But now we're going to see, right? Because it's put up a shut up time, mm. kind of, right? You're in the office. You don't have the excuse of Congress. You have both the House and the Senate. Yes. Right? You don't have the Supreme Court, but you do have the House, the Senate, and the executive branch. So let's see what you're in at. And I don't, and I'll be lying. Like, I don't expect radical overnight change. But certain things, you know, I think are reasonable to expect, you know, body cams, everyone turned on, you know, when you're interacting at all times. Um, you know, I do think looking at the funding of police, which I think is different than saying, hey, no police departments. But I think overfunding a certain police and putting those funds towards other community resources are probably a strategy I would expect and hope for. So things like that, I would like to see. So we will see how it goes, but more hopeful mainly because of the administration, but I don't know 
once again, if I'm being in an honest moment, how much I truly expect the change, mm. right? Like I just, because once again, we've been burned before. Like it's not, it's not the first time. So we shall see, man. What about you? I'm uh, in the exact same boat as I was the first time we had this conversation. I'm in the exact same boat as I've been most of my adult life uh, as a minority, uh, as an African-American man. Um, hopeful, you know, I have children. Um, I have an eight year old and a 13 year old. I'm hopeful, hopeful for them, hopeful for myself, hopeful for, you know, just all of us. But my expectations at this point remain the same. We'll see what happens at this point. Like you said, put up a shut up. We'll see policy wise. We'll see just in the consciousness and just like the mindsets of, you know, just individuals from all races and particularly, you know, if I'm being complete, uh, being honest about it, white people. Um, you know, do you acknowledge? Yes. Okay. At this point, I can no longer say that, you know, everybody is just making stuff up or they're just hiding behind their race. And, you know, all this is justified. Like, okay. You were made more aware of it. And, and there was definitely more support from other races, which was, you know, important. But um, as Trevor Stevens would say, we will remember your words. Do your, do your actions, you know, after the fact, after the smoke, the initial smoke clear speak to that because that's gonna be an important component as much as any policy that may be enacted anywhere. Um, so I'm hopeful. And, uh, you, know, you know, for this, my sake, for my children's sake, just for the, the sake of everyone involved, I'm hopeful that we can be better than uh, what we have been. You know, we have had an African-American president. We have had, we now have a African-American vice president, a uh, woman, you know, so I'm hopeful that there can be change. Is it gonna be, you know, as swift as I would like it? No. But, you know, have I seen signs of it? I have. And do I, am I hopeful that I'll continue to see signs of it? Yeah, I am. I hope. But right now, my expectation level and my hope level are on completely different, uh, uh, on di completely different uh, levels. So we'll see. Um, and I do want to hit on something real quick, um, as it does apply to the sports angle again, when I talked about the Jacob Blake shooting and how really led by the NBA, all sports leagues just took a pause to say, look, we're going to acknowledge this. You saw that once the NBA got back in action, they had the Black Lives Matter. You even see the NFL, they had the video with various players. Um, and, you know, Tom, and you also had like an open letter. Uh, Roger D Goodell did his, uh, his thing. And it was all about just social justice, shows, uh, social, you know, reform, and also just equality. Now we get away from that. And, you know, as the NFL regular season, comes to an end, one big talking point that we've noticed outside of just the championship games that are on the way. We're recording this on, what's today? The 24th, so this is actually AFC and NFC championship uh, game Sunday. So we've had firings of head coaches who underachieve. My Eagles need to get their shit together, but that's a whole nother conversation. Uh, but in all seriousness, we have had, well, I think six or, six or seven uh, hires for new head coaches. Um, one minority, no African Americans, and in a sport, and I'm talking about the NFL here, that is dominated, you know, still primarily by uh, African Americans. We have two African American coaches, Mike Tomlin and uh, and Flores, Brian Flores, down in Miami. Um, no, so no Eric Bieniemy, no other, and again, we have the Rooney Rule, so that they are interviewed, but being interviewed and being hired is two completely different things, as we all know in any profession. Um, what does it say that in the midst of this social justice and awareness that when it's all said and done in the most popular sport in this country, when it comes to anything from ownership to GM to head coach, nothing's really changed. What does that, what does that, what does that speak to, man? Oh, I mean, it's the good old boy network. Let's be, let's just, if we're being honest, let's just be real. It's the good old boy network. Mm -hmm. And it's also the fact that they're insulting our intelligence. That's the part about it, right? Because when you look at the enemy, right? They love to use the excuse, oh, well, he didn't call the plays. Well, wait a minute. Neither did Matt Nagy, right? And he, mm. he, he got the job in Chicago and, oh, well, he doesn't interview well. Well, I just saw a press conference with the Detroit Lions oh head coach. And he was saying a bunch of dumb ish. So, what? So, but you hired him. So it's kind of like they're just insulting, you know, tell us, oh, well, this person is a quarterback coach. So we're going to, but 
this person's been so you know it's just the insult of like you will find every reason in the world to hire someone else someone else except for the most qualified and mind you there should be more names than I mentioned, like Ty Bowles yes. uh, and everything like that. Raheem we, Morris. Yeah, Raheem Morris, Leslie Frazier should probably earn another opportunity. But we only, Brian Lefkowitz, like, we only focus on the one. And we can't, and they won't even hire that one. Right? Like, there's a good chance unless the Texans hire him. Right, and the only reason I think we cape so hard is because we know he's qualified. That doesn't even mean he's going to be a success, right? He could get the job and suck, but he deserves the opportunity where everybody else is getting that opportunity. So, and not just him, but other people, but his is so glaring because you've seen the pipeline of other offensive coordinators under Andy Reid and how they went, and now all of a sudden, it just stops for him. So it is frustrating. And I think, but I don't know what you do, right? Because the league can only do so much. Right. And I don't necessarily blame the league for it because. I blame uh, Goodell for it. I think he really it, does yeah. want progression, but you cannot make these owners. Go ahead. You, you, you just said it. You were just saying it. Yeah. You can't force them to hire. Like, so, and, and discrimination is hard to prove. Right, it, like it's one of those things that is just from a legal perspective. I mean, you can have our ideas, but from a legal perspective, it's just hard to prove. So, I think they're doing the league. I don't know what else you could do, honestly. I mean, you could probably create a pipe, create a better pipeline of minority coaches to coordinator positions, which would then maybe help, you know, with the head coaching, but. I don't know what you do, All right? So I think we're going to see because, once again, he might suck, but they, he still deserves the opportunity, which is all I think people are asking for. It's the opportunity that he has more than earned. More than earned. And that's key. More than earned. <laughs> it's the opportunity based on what he has, the fact that it was earned, not because of the color of his skin, but the fact that he earned it. Yeah. You know, um, as I as I heard you, you know, speaking there, just you know, it brings me back to my favorite line I've ever heard in um, in any movie, and from one of my favorite movies of all time, Training Day, Alonzo. It's not what you know; it's what you can prove. It's yeah. not what you know; it's what you can prove. You know, we know what's going on, but again, discrimination is hard to prove, but. Again, you know, to our to our earlier to the earlier point that we had, we're hopeful, but at some point, put up a shut up, and then that increases our expectations. So, um, and I did want to stay with this just for a moment because I had a conversation with a friend of mine, um, and for full disclosure, he's uh, he's white, and you know, he came to me, and uh, we were just you know really chopping it up over just other stuff. But then he said, "Look, man, I want to talk to you about something." Um, he said before the George Floyd, you know, situation, he said, you know, you've known me for 10 years, so you know, I'm not racist, but there was a part of me that simply believed that a lot, not you, because I know you, but a lot of minorities, a lot of black people were hiding behind the race card when they know they was out here doing shit that they shouldn't be doing or doing things they shouldn't be doing. And they were just basically saying, okay, I'm being discriminated against, or I'm being, um, you know, profiled just because I'm black. He said, but the George Floyd situation really opened my eyes to the fact that, no, this happens a lot often than I ever thought that it did, that just based on your race, certain things can happen to you that wouldn't happen if you were white. He said, okay, but I have a question for you, and I'm going to pose this to you. He asked me, he said, okay, if Black people in this country were put in the position that white people have been you know, for hundreds of years where you knew whether you thought about it consciously or not, that you had an advantage when you walked into, you know, boardrooms and when you walked into executive meetings or when you were, you know, going for certain jobs, that your skin tone was going to give you a natural advantage over your white counterpart. So he said, say if this, everything that's been going on here has been in reverse and you have been accustomed to that, 
your whole life and you have seen that that's been really the way that things have played out for your race for hundreds of years. And then all of a sudden the white people said, okay, we, we all know this is, this is garbage, this is unfair and this needs to change. Does it make you racist? Not because you have a problem with the white person, but if you say, look, man, this has been an advantage I've been taking, uh, you know, uh, I've, I've had my whole life and I ain't trying to give that up. Does that make me a racist? And if not, what does that make me? And it's one of those moments where, again, this is, he didn't, you know, he, he said, look, I'm comfortable talking to you because you know me and I know you. So I know this ain't going to go left or go to a point where it's going to be, you know, uh, some, some, like some crazy drama or whatever. But he was like, I can guarantee you that the question I'm asking you right now is a question or something that's been thought of by a lot of white people. I'm not racist, but I am aware of whether I think about it or not, that my race has given me an advantage that I don't want to see taken away from me. Am I wrong for that? Uh, I mean, he's not, he's human. I don't think he's wrong. I, I, I don't, well, let me, let me rephrase that. Mm. I think he's human, right? I think that's a very human emotion mm. to not want to give up the power that you earn. Do I think he's wrong? Yes, because mm. that, because that power comes at the expense of the oppression of others. Yes. So that's that's the issue, right? Naturally, you don't want to give up power. That's just human. Anyway, like you most people don't want to in general. But you have to understand where you're wrong at or where he's particularly wrong is you have to give up some of that because that comes at the cost of other people. It's just like if we're having an honest conversation, right? Me and you as dudes, right? It's just Black men, we have a certain, in the patriarchy, society, whatever you want to call it, we have a certain advantage as men that Black women don't particularly have, mm. right? But we have to be willing to give up some of that privilege because our privilege comes at the oppression of women, <laughs> right? So mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of the same thing, right? And it's going to be uncomfortable because particularly when you're talking about giving it up, you're not only, you got to think about what else has come because that comes from the engravement of just talking about white people, white culture, right? Right, that's the thing, right? It's not just that, it's that your whole culture, right? You, you have imposed your way of doing things on an entire society that is multicultural, right? It's not just, just the way white people want to do things, it's the way you know, black people do things. It might be the way Hispanic culture, right? That culture engraving is also another important part of, right? So everything from hair in corporate America that gets kind of legislated that your hair has to look one way, that's deemed professional. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Where the way an African-American might naturally rock their hair might look completely different, right? So all those things come into play to where you have to give that up because, because of the of what comes from it, right? The expense that it comes from is just too high. So that's what I would say is I get it. Like in an honest moment, I get why you don't want to give up power. Nobody does. Like that's just what it is. But it's wrong because it comes at the expense of other people. And that gotta be a price you and that price is just too high, no matter who it is, right? For us as guys, once again, we have a certain privilege. We we'd be lying if we say we didn't. All right, <laughs> so we gotta be willing to give up some of that because it comes, or even most of that, excuse me, because it comes at the expense of women, particularly black women being oppressed. So, I mean, that's just the way I look at it, kind of. That's what's up, man. And, you know, my response to him um, was pretty much what you said. And I just shortened it to say, look, at the end of the day, fam, I was like, if it was flipped, ultimately, just as an as a individual person and as a people and as a race, I would like to think that, yeah, it would be uncomfortable, you know, losing that advantage, but ultimately I want to feel like anything that I achieve, anything that happens with me is something that was earned fairly, keyword, fairly, fairly. Mm -hmm. Not because I had an advantage going in, not because I, had a, I was like a human cheat code walking in. So you know, we, yeah, we may be going for the same thing or trying to go after the same goal, but if I am, have a, you know, skin, you know, tone uh, cheat code, that ultimately I'm going in with an advantage that you don't have. That's not fair. 
So whatever you earn, I'm pretty sure, you know, I talked to him. I was like, everything that you are proud of, you feel like you earn, right? He was like, yeah. I was like, okay, then same thing applies here. It's not about it flipping so that it goes the other way. And, you know, that was our conversation we had before. We're not asking for more. We're just asking for equality and equal opportunity for things based on that, you know, what we earn. So, you know, shout out to him, man. He uh, invited him to be on, but he was like, look, man, talking to you is one thing, but he was just like, you know, I don't know how others would take it that don't know me. But he was like, if you don't mind posing that, I'll tune in and listen and just kind of hear what another perspective outside of your own. So, um, and look, man, this, this episode really spoke, it, I wanted this episode to really kind of speak to where we were coming from that based on actual events. You know, we wasn't coming on here, you know, telling myself and CJ from Villains of Vinyl, we didn't come on this episode to just be like, hey, listen to us. You know, we know everything. We're right. And no, 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 no. We came on to give you our perspective on things that occur. You know, Champions Material, this is a platform where you can get opinions, perspective, but also a platform for those to be able to agree uh, to disagree but ultimately do it in a healthy way. And that's all we were trying to do here, man. Point blank period. That's all I'm gonna try to do on any episode that I do for any topic I try to do and with any guest that I have on. So again, just to kind of bring it full circle. If you, oh, yeah. if you are a Trump supporter, you know, don't feel like if our views means that we're attacking you. We are just giving you our perspective. You feel me? You you about to say something, my brother? No, I was gonna say that's important to say, right? Because once, well, particularly with the Trump supporters or people who have an opposing view, right? Once again, we can you know talk about why whether it's fair, or unfair, but you can't take away the fact that for whatever reason they feel threatened. Period. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong, because uh, that's just too deep of a conversation. We don't have the time to get into it, right, right. but the actual emotion of them feeling threatened is real. Mm. So let's talk about it because I understand how it feels to feel threatened. So let's have, and I don't know if we can ever come to a discourse because some of, some of the opinions are based on what you think of me as a human. And then that's where we kind of disagree on what you, you know, on the humanity of people or the rights of people to live their lives their way or just to be free in their own choosing when it's not based on how you think life should be lived. I might have an issue with that that's just irreconcilable. But the bottom line is we got to share this country. (laughs) So Mm. that's just the bottom line. Like, whether we like it or not, that's just what it is. So let's figure out a way we may never like each other. We may never fuck with each other, <laughs> right? Fair, <laughs> fine, I don't have to come to your house. I don't gotta like you. But we gotta figure out a way to live and coexist without me being in fear, my people being in fear, women being in fear, gay people being in fear and all of that. We gotta find a way. So, you know, I'm open to talk to anyone up to a certain point, like that's me. But some of your view, it just depends on the views, right? It's like anything else. So, yeah, but like you said, it's not an attack, We're just giving our perspective. And once again, even in that, there might be somebody who listen to what we say and be like, nah, you're wrong on this and check us on a few things, right? That's, you gotta be open to be educated. Yes. And I think that's the yes. thing, to, to your point, everybody's so concerned about being right. <laughs> like you said, like Trevor said. So I understand that we just had this full conversation. Somebody might be like, bro, you was wrong on this point. You was wrong on this point. You was wrong on this point. Here's the facts to back it up. Okay, fair enough. Be open to be educated. And every education lesson is not a judgment on you as a human. So it's the way I would frame it. Equality and acceptance, man. Equality in acceptance and always be willing to have an open mind and to CJ's point, just be educated. Uh, The better educated we are, uh, the better off everyone is. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave it there. Um, My brother, I definitely appreciate you coming through here, man. And I do wanna take a moment to uh, allow you to 
uh, really just call out uh, everything that's going on with your project. That's the Villains of Vinyl podcast, as well as uh, VCW, because you all do a great work over there. And I want you to uh, go ahead and take a moment to let the people know everything about VNV. The floor is yours, man. Okay. Well, on a lighter note, because everything that we covered is just heavy, mm -hmm. uh, I do hope I am one part of the podcast that talks about hip hop and nerd stuff. You know, we talk about, you know, just things like uh, WandaVision. We're coming up doing a review of that. Mm. We talk about the best rap album of the year, uh, well, at least of 2020, which, you know, some of us have popular opinions, some of us have unpopular opinions, for example. I didn't like Buster Rhymes' last album. Yeah, I said it. So all those, <laughs> all those now. different things. So that's VNV. If you just want to laugh, kind of disagree with us, say we full of shit, you know, just shoot the stuff. That's that podcast. And then VCW also is a podcast where if you are wrestling head, I know it's fake. We already get it. But that's what we watch. It's our nerdy stuff. So if you want to listen to that, kind of listen to that. So VCW and VNV, two podcasts, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, wherever they're, wherever the podcast that you listen to is called Villains and Vinyl. So thanks. All right. My appreciation to you, my man, for coming on and uh, definitely giving us, you know, uh, your thoughts on everything that's happening. Um, definitely check CJ and his team out. Again, that's Villains and Vinyl, as well as VCW. Anywhere podcasts are found, uh, quality work uh, from those brothers. Uh, my thanks to you out there, the audience, for tuning in. Again, this is um, not necessarily a fun topic, but this is an important topic, uh, important topics, I should say. Um, sometimes uncomfortable, but needed conversations because we need growth and we need unity. This is not about a political party. This is not about pro-Trump, anti-Trump. This is not a knock to anyone who is pro-Trump. You have a right to your opinion. We were just giving you ours. And uh, as we've been alluding to throughout the episode here, we got to come together because this is bigger than politics. This is bigger than just any one race. You know what I mean? This pandemic is killing us, The you know, all of that. We have got to come together and put our differences aside. The reality of the situation is, you know, we can do this. The question is, will we do this? And will we do it the right way? That is the question. Um, as always, Champions Material, you know where we at. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, the official Champions Material YouTube channel. And as I introduced on uh, the season two premiere, um, our Champions Material Discord channel, that's where we come through. Uh, you know, it's a chance for me to get to know you guys, for you all to get to know me. We can talk show topics, life topics, doesn't matter. You know what I mean? That's our a safe space to do what we do. Um, if you're already familiar with Discord, Look for me. I'm a uh, Sean V6172. My profile pic is the Joker. And if you're not familiar with Discord, um, you can get at me or on the premiere episode for season two at about the 47 minute mark is when I break it all down as far as how to get situated and how to get set up. Um, not that difficult. It's a one time thing. And once you do it, uh, it's on. So definitely let's make that happen. I'm interested to see um, how our community grows throughout this season and looking forward, very much looking forward to get to know you all as the listeners who take the time in to uh, check out this show. One thing I wanted to do as I come to an end is I wanted to really crystallize, you know, some of the things that we talked about in this episode, particularly from a social justice and racial standpoint. Um, as CJ put it, we're not asking as minorities, as black uh, minorities, we're not asking for any special privileges or special advantages. We're just asking for equality. And in order for us to get to that point, we need to be honest about where we are now and some of the things that are going on as far as the imbalance, uh, as far as how things are done based on race. Black Lives Matter protest, um, we saw the president's response, the outgoing president's response. Um, what we saw at the Capitol, we saw the response. And there was a clear difference and that difference was based on race for anyone who truly believes that if any other race primarily was in the crowd doing what we saw at the Capitol, that it would have been the same response. We have to stop lying to ourselves because we know better and we know different. And I could, you know, speak to this a little bit more, but there was something that I heard um, on the day of the Capitol attacks uh, from a young lady. And, you know, my apologies if I can get her name 
I'll definitely, uh, you know, credit her on the future episode because I think she honestly nailed it to a T in regards to the inequality and what really was going down in the mentality, um, frankly, of those. And again, it's not a representation on all white people. Let's be clear. But for those white people who chose to, um, you know, do what they did, there was a, she did a great job. The person that you're about to hear that I'm going to play as I close this out, did a great job of really breaking down what the difference was and just what the situation was as a whole. And before I do that, I close this episode as I always do. Never forget whoever you want to be and whatever you want to be. Always be the champion of it. That's champion's material. Stay tuned. We'll be back sooner than later with our next episode. But for now, I'm going to give this young lady the floor and pull this up. Here we go. Not hurt, taking care with their bodies, not like they treated Freddie Gray's body. White Americans aren't afraid of the cops. White Americans are never afraid of the cops, even when they're committing insurrection, even when they're engaged in attempting to occupy our capital to steal the votes of people who look like me. Because in their minds, they own this country, they own that capital, they own the cops, the cops work for them, and people like me have no damn right to try to elect a president. Because we don't get to pick the president. They get to pick the president. They own the president. They own the White House. They own this country. And so when you think you own it, you own the place, you ain't afraid of the police because the police are you. And the police reflect back to them. We're with you. You're good. We're not going to hurt you because you're not them. Guarantee you if that was a Black Lives Matter protest in D.C., there would already be people shackled, arrested, or dead. Facts. We're done. <laughs>